to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. As you'll be aware, the Minister is not available today, and I'm sure all members join with me in wishing Mr Putz a very speedy recovery. Speaker has received notification from the Minister for the Economy that she will be responding today to questions on Minister Putz's behalf. I call Claire Sugden to ask the first question. Ms Sugden. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Um, can I thank the member for her question? And Mr. Speaker, with your permission, just uh, before we start this session, uh, I want to say that um, I'm happy to stand in for my colleague, but also to inform the House that I was speaking to him this morning. He'd had his toast and porridge and was in very good form um, and looking forward to getting out of hospital again. Uh, but obviously, he's had quite a traumatic period over the weekend. So we'll. Um, do our best to answer your questions um, as, as they arise. The department publishes uh, statistical reports that contain the latest average farm gate prices in Northern Ireland. Within each of these reports, average prices are reported for the latest periods, along with comparisons against prices in previous periods. These reports show that average beef, lamb and pig prices during January to September 2020 have been higher than those of the same period for 2019, whereas average milk prices have been 0.9 pence per litre lower. They also show that average prices since September have remained either around or above prices of the previous year for each of the farm uh, products that are reported. Ms. Sogdom. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank you, Minister. And please pass on uh, my uh, best wishes to Minister Putson in a speedy recovery. Um, I, I, I suppose it's quite fortunate that it's the Minister for the Economy um, answering these questions, and if the Pre Principal Deputy Speaker would indulge me. Would the Minister for the Economy like to give her assessment of farm gate prices in Northern Ireland, given that agriculture is one of our largest industries in Northern Ireland and underpins our local economy? Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, in many ways, um, agriculture has been an area of policy that I've, I've uh, looked at for many, many years in the European Parliament um, and really have enjoyed meeting with and talking to the sectors right across Northern Ireland. So what we uh, understand uh, from uh, the statistics that are published is that um, milk prices um, have on average um, are a little lower um, and um, although uh, milk prices for September were 1.5.9 pence uh, higher than in September uh, 2018. Um, but the average price across the period that we're talking about is 0.9% uh, lower. And it represents really um, and the, the volatility and even the price is lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. And it represents um, just uh, the, the market uh, and the exposure that uh, Northern Ireland milk prices have, for example, to the commodity market. Um, whereas in uh, GB, much, much greater supplies of their milk supply goes into the liquid market and supermarkets. And, um, uh, producers can have longer, more stable uh, contracts. Um, in relation to beef prices, um, we understand that beef prices um, um, for the week ending the 21st of November are 13.2% higher than for the same period last year. And that was, uh, is a difference of £150 per finished head. Uh, of cattle. So that's a significant uplift in beef prices. Um, and in fact, we probably are the third in the EU league table of beef prices as we currently uh, stand. But nevertheless, again, um, from a processing point of view, this is typ typically a low margin um, process um, where um, really um, the issues around competitiveness and productivity are, are hugely important as well. Pig prices have remained uh, much uh, the same. Um, and uh, again, dog cow prices are um, around about or slightly higher than we would have expected. I'm, I'm loath to interrupt the minister and um, <laughs> she'll probably give me a kick in for it afterwards. But um, 
I, I think it's important that we try to stick to two minutes or less. Um, Mr. Jim Allister. Um, looking forward, Minister, uh, under the iniquitous protocol, the impact on uh, overheads and production costs are going to be very adversely affected uh, by reason of feedstuff uh, imports, fertiliser imports. So what is likely to be the consequence for profitability and farm gate prices and indeed consumer prices? What is likely to be the consequences of the gallows for the union that Minister Putz is building at our ports? Well, of course, the ports issue is uh, um, an implementation issue rather than uh, an issue around uh, the end of the transition period. Um, for Northern Ireland as a whole, let's be absolutely clear that my party believes that having a free trade deal, zero uh, quota, zero tariff, um, is in the best interests of Northern Ireland. We also understand and, and, and uh, want people to understand that there are issues under the protocol that we think uh, could be sorted out. So we want to see unfettered access between us and our main market. Now, of course, um, and I understand the bill is being reintroduced today uh, in Parliament, um, there is a legislative route for that within the United Kingdom. But there are also routes for that within the Joint Committee. And sensible, practical, pragmatic approaches by the EU could ensure that these things happen. We want to understand um, that um, goods um, at risk um, will uh, be sorted out in the Joint Committee. And as the member quite rightly says, those goods coming in to uh, Northern Ireland for inputs into the agriculture sector, um, that they are treated as not being at risk of going into the single market. Mr Patsy McLone. Thanks very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And I too would just uh, join with others in, in wishing all the very best to, to Edwin, to the Minister, uh, for a, a speedy and full recovery. Um, a tricky enough situation he found himself in over the weekend. So, Minister, uh, I don't necessarily expect you to know the answer to this one because it's a bit complicated, but I've been contacted by a sheep farmer this morning who has bought hundreds of sheep and they're in the UK. Now, the sheep before they can be brought over here have to be a year old. Uh, that year will take them into the new year. So, um, with everything that's going on at the moment, he finds himself basically in New Year limbo land as to whether or not he may bring them over, and he has invested considerable hundreds of thousands of pounds in that stock. So we spoke earlier about productivity. We need the product to be able to be productive. So perhaps the Minister could get back to me with some clarity around that, please. Yes, um, thank you for your good wishes, uh, Ted. And I'll certainly pass on the good wishes of the House when I speak to him later, give him an update on how we got on. Um, in fact, this is an issue that the Minister actually updated the Executive on um, in our EU Executive meeting on Thursday, and an issue that I know he has been working on over the uh, past number of days. And uh, there is, as yet, uh, there still needs to be a resolution, but I, of course, will ask the Minister to write to you specifically on the issue uh, and with any uh, ways of resolving this impasse. Mrs Rosemary Barton. Minister, also, if you could pass on my good wishes to Mr Poots and wish him a speedy recovery. Minister, would an oversight similar to the grocery code adjudicator that is in place throughout the United Kingdom, but tailored for Northern Ireland needs, be of assistance perhaps to improve farm gate prices if they, if in the future? Um, again, thank uh, the member for her good wishes. Um, there has been much talk about minimum price legislation um, and there has uh, about uh, Northern Ireland primary producers being price takers as opposed to price makers um, within uh, the whole um, supply chain system. Um, personally, I'm, I, I think that while the groceries adjudicator had the potential to do good things, I think the lack of any kind of enforcement powers meant that this was largely um, something um, that, that sounded good, 
but didn't actually have the powers to respond to the needs of the supply chain. And therefore, if we were going to have more of this, we would need to have something that had much, much more uh, powers legislative to actually take remedial action. Ms. Emma Sheeran. And I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Um, just following on from the question that was asked by my constituency colleague, Mr McGlone, I know I've written to um, your colleague, Mr Putz, about this issue as well, about the, the fact that sheep now being brought in from Scotland, the uh, majority of them would be black-faced sheep that require scrippy monitoring. Um, and I just want to, to press upon the Minister the urgency, because as Mr McGlone has mentioned, this involves thousands of pounds for, for local sheep producers that are depending upon sheep that they, are, they have already bought from Scotland. Um, and again, um, I know that the Minister is alive to the situation, the Minister will respond to the situation, and I suppose on a general point, it demonstrates the issues around the protocol, and why some in this House who call for the full implementation of the protocol create rods for the backs of some of our farmers. Mr William Humphrey. Principal Deputy Speaker, question number two. Thank you uh, for the question. Responsibility for dealing with illegal dumping is shared between local councils who deal with low-level waste offences and NIEA who deal with large-scale waste criminality and hazardous waste. While uh, there are no plans at present to strengthen the legislation around illegal dumping, officials are working with councils to consider the effectiveness of the existing legislation and explore how they can work together to make best use of the powers that they provide. This may create opportunities to deal more quickly and effectively with lower level offending on a local level through p fixed penalty notices rather than being reliant on court proceedings, the timings of which are outside our control. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Over the summer, some 200 tonnes of illegal rubbish was dumped in Eden Dairy Industrial Mill, my constituency in the Crumlin Road, North Belfast. This led to a plague of rats, a swarm of flies, noxious smells, people feeling and taking ill. As a response, Belfast City Council was too slow. The Northern Ireland Environment Agency was somewhat secretive in passing information, sharing information with elected representatives. The situation simply not good enough, and it took an intervention from the Minister to resolve it. Can I ask the Minister, in responding for her colleague, Mr Poots, to whom I too sent my regards to this morning for a speedy recovery, what more can the Department do working with local councils to ensure that if such a situation arises again, and sadly it is happening more often in Northern Ireland, that we can have a more effective and speedy response? Can I uh, thank the member again for his question? And I understand and followed the story um, and how it impacted on the lives of local people um, in uh, that part of the Shankill. Um, it is really quite disgraceful that these things um, continue to happen. Um, and I suppose the answer lies in this closer working relationship between district councils and NIEA, um, so that while NIEA are responsible for the, the larger uh, waste criminality, that councils can take a proactive approach around uh, fly tipping um, and trying to bring the two together so that one is not passing the responsibility on to the other and we need a situation like we had in the Shankill where uh, there had to be um, an intervention from the Minister uh, to, to, to actually do that. Um, the additional powers that we would be looking at and that the Minister will be looking at would be uh, around councils giving them discretionary powers to take enforcement action uh, in respect of illegal waste disposal other than littering um, and with the provision of uh, more robust penalties for them. Um, as this works through the system. Dr. Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Uh, Deputy Principal Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for her comments so far. Uh, first of all, could she pass on our good wishes to Edwin? And it's good to see that he'll be getting some first hand knowledge of how well our NHS is coping at this present moment in time. But I would like to ask the Minister if there's any information to confirm that waste is coming from the Republic of Ireland and is now being dumped in Northern Ireland illegally. Uh, again, can I thank my colleague for his good wishes for Edwin, but to remind everyone that Edwin is a former health minister in this house and is acutely aware 
um, of uh, how uh, amazing uh, our National Health Service has been uh, in response to the pandemic. His wife also is a nurse who has had many years of service uh, in uh, the National Health Service. Um, I uh, do not specifically have information on that. If there is specific information in the department, I will, of course, ask the department to write to you uh, on this uh, very specific area. I am aware that there have been various news stories around this issue, um, and we need to make sure that criminality of this sort is dealt with and that appropriate penalties are levied and costs directed to where they should be. Mr. Cathal Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Principal and Deputy Speaker. I would thank the Minister for her answer so far and extend good wishes to the Minister and speedy recovery. But could I ask the Minister, uh, in relation to the illegal dumping, cross, especially cross border, I know in my own constituency, in the Fuse Forest, at a, a nature spot called Caricature Viewpoint, there has been over 50 incidents of illegal dumping over the last 18 months. Um, would the Minister bring it back to the to Minister Poots that we need a cross-border operation here to ensure, because there is clear evidence in some of this illegal dumping that that is what is happening, and I would like a cross-border approach. Coramil Mogget. Yes, um, I uh, fully accept and agree with you that, um, and I know the Minister will as well talk to his counterpart to ensure that this kind of criminality um, does not take place and that we can levy appropriate fines, make sure costs are apportioned appropriately and sensibly in the matter. Uh, and of course, I am sure that the Department will write to you on any specific instances they have around uh, the beauty uh, area that you talk about. Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Well, Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, given that we did see an increase or appear to see an increase in illegal dumping during the COVID lockdown, I'm just wondering how the Department is working with NIEA and the councils to look at broader issues around waste management. Thank you. The Council um, and uh, NIEA and the Department are looking at how effective the legislation currently is. They will bring uh, forward further uh, proposals uh, around that. Uh, as I said uh, to my uh, colleague uh, from uh, the Shankle, where there were very, very serious incidents around this, um, and that those additional powers would uh, be conferred on councils to perhaps uh, have a more immediate response uh, to the issue of littering um, and uh, uh, illegal dumping. Mr. Gordon Dunn. Principal Deputy Speaker. The UK-Japan uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement was signed on the 22nd of October 2020 and is largely based on the existing agreement between the EU and Japan. Similarly, the agreement in principle with Canada announced on the 21st of November 2020 will roll over the provisions of the existing Comprehensive Economic uh, tr uh, Trade Agreement. Both these agreements have still to be fully ratified but once this has been done, they will give certainty for agri-food businesses exporting goods and will ensure they can continue to benefit from existing trading arrangements. For example, CETA includes tariff-free trade on 98% of goods that can be exported to Canada, including beef, fish and seafood. The CEPA agreement with Japan also secured tariff-free access for more agri-food goods and protection for some of our iconic products. Commitments on tariffs for both the UK and Japan have largely been transitioned uh, from the EU deal without changes. This deal sees tariffs for UK exports to Japan fall on beef, uh, pork, salmon and a range of other agricultural uh, exports subject to staged tariff liberalisation which is in line with the EU agreement. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. I too pass on my best wishes to the Agriculture Minister Edmund Poots. I got a message today from him saying that he's receiving great service. So he obviously appreciates the health service that he had a contribution to as Minister. Uh, I do thank the, the Minister for her answers and I welcome the great news and the opportunities there are for uh, the agri food sector in Northern Ireland. Can the Minister give us uh, assurance? that incoming 
uh, products and imports into Northern Ireland will meet the continuous high quality standards that are required? Um, Northern Ireland um, will um, meet uh, the standards because Northern Ireland will continue to employ um, EU uh, single market rules uh, in relation to these issues. I suppose the wider issue that the member refers to is around the potential for wider UK uh, free trade deals. And what we would really like to see there is that the United Kingdom as a whole makes sure that it does not accept um, agricultural produce that is uh, produced to a lesser standard, either environmentally or uh, socially, uh, in terms of the employment uh, aspects of this, uh, than it would expect uh, of Northern Ireland or other uh, member states from the United Kingdom. It is really important uh, that we do not make Northern Ireland produce, indeed United Kingdom produce, uncompetitive by undercutting it with cheap imports. Dr. Kiva Archibald. Gurmagat, a previous Concordia, and I'd also like to extend um, my good wishes to, to Edwin to, to get well soon. Um, can I ask the, the Minister, um, you referred to it yourself, that the, the UK Japan free trade agreement largely replicates that with the EU. Um, but would the Minister accept that, due to the fact that there were no new tariff rate quotas, um, agree that some exporters could actually be at a disadvantage under this agreement? Gurmagat. The, the Japan agreement largely replicates um, the agreement that the, um, the EU has um, with um, Japan as well. Um, commitments and tariffs have been largely transitioned without changes, and this will see tariffs for UK exports uh, to Japan fall on pork, beef, salmon and other agricultural produce. Um, where for, milk, for butter, milk and milk powders, uh, where there were uh, UK exports in 2019, UK exporters will continue to access Japan's market via their WTO TRQ. Mr Allen Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd certainly like to join in the good wishes to uh, Minister Poots and his uh, reassuring that the NHS was there for him in a timely manner when he needed it. Uh, Minister, following the 1st of January 2021, will Northern Ireland food products, food products for export be labelled UK or EU? These are matters that will be worked out in the Joint Committee. Mr John Stewart. John Blair. Sorry. Good principal, Deputy Speaker. <laughs> On autopilot. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all associate myself and, and my colleagues with the good wishes expressed to Minister Poots in wishing him a full and, and speedy recovery? Um, I think that the Minister has clarified that, that uh, what is being talked about is at very best a replication of existing uh, EU uh, arrangements in terms of Canada and Japan. Can I ask more specifically then from either an economic or agricultural perspective if the Minister can tell us if there is any data available? to show that there, if there is any benefit at all in terms of uh, trade or economy to, to the new arrangements? Um, I am presuming you mean um, in relation to the trade uh, deals with Japan and Canada. Canada is one of our largest partners. The um, EU-Canada, uh, the CETA agreement trade deal, means that 98% of all products that pass between, those two uh, between the countries and now the United Kingdom actually are tariff-free. So that is a huge boost um, to the economy uh, of Northern Ireland, to the wider economy of the United Kingdom. And the good news about the Canada deal is that um, they are committed not just to the rollover of the deal, as we currently signed in November, but the renegotiation of parts of that deal so that it is bespoke for the rest of the United Kingdom. 
So it is a really important trade deal for Northern Ireland. The Japan trade deal is also important. Japan is one of the largest importers of agricultural produce in the world. There is an enormous opportunity to take uh, our product uh, to that market. So that is an, another extremely important trade deal uh, for the Northern Ireland economy. The crux of the matter for Northern Ireland will be making sure that we are a full part of those trade deals notwithstanding the implications of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Once again, I apologise to the member for getting his name wrong. There's only one John Blair. Um, Mr Colin McGrath. In number four, Mr Speaker. I thank the member uh, for his question. Um, gorse or wildfires in mountainous areas in Northern Ireland have a significant impact on the environment and are a risk to life and property. Semi-natural habitats, which are often affected by such fires, include heathlands and blanket bog. Many of these areas are important nature conservation sites. Indeed, between 2010 and 2019, 64 wildfires have been recorded in areas of special scientific interest. These habitats can be damaged by fires with impacts ranging from gradual change in species composition arising from surface burns to complete loss of vegetation and seed banks in severe deep burns. In surface burns, the shift in vegetation composition can be undesirable, such as increases in gorse or bracken, whilst in deep burn, the impacts can lead to long-term erosion due to lack of vegetation cover. The wildlife living within these areas are also negatively impacted, including the loss of foraging areas and the destruction of nests and eggs of important breeding hens, uh, birds such as the hen harriers. The damage caused to habitats and species can take many years to recover or they may be lost forever. Such fires also threaten life, property, forestry, agriculture, land, public water supplies and other public utilities and impact on emergency response services to the cost of millions of pounds to the public purse. Most of these wildfires are the result of human activities and are preventable. Proactive steps to recognise and address the risk of wildfires have and will continue to be taken by, by my department, other stakeholders and landowners. Through public messaging, awareness raising, the establishment of wildfire groups such as in the Mourns and the Belfast Hills and the development of wildfire management plans in areas uh, of special scientific interest. Officials have gained considerable expertise in regard of, to the issues of wildfires through liaison with local landowners and knowledge exchange with other European countries and will continue uh, to develop uh, ways forward. 2020, uh, Minister. Uh, just can I add one important fact, 2020 was the worst year uh, for wildfire uh, fires since 2011 and up to May of this year the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service had had to deal with over 600. Mr McGrath. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the comprehensive response and add my weight to those remarks for Minister Putz to wish him well. Um, would the Minister agree that something has happened because the number of wildfires within mountainous areas across the north and across the island of Ireland is substantially increasing? Uh, events which were only supposed to happen one in a hundred years, one in fifty years, are happening on an annual basis. It's costing millions of pounds. Would the Minister agree that maybe climate change is playing a part here and that we must respond? Respond accordingly. I think, as, as my answer made clear, I think that there are a range of factors involved in this, um, including um, pressures from climate change, but also human behaviour um, within when people are uh, walking in the mountains, uh, etc. Um, what we need to ensure that they, we are working together, that we are. Um, properly disseminating information about one, the dangers, but two, also the dangers to our environment and the cost to the public purse uh, around these uh, issues. Mr. Declan McAleer. Um, can I get, uh, thank the Minister for the answer. Uh, I also want to be associated with ex extending uh, my best wishes to the Minister. I sent a message earlier on today, so I'm glad to note that he's 
he's going in the right direction. I want to commend Minister Dodds for coming in short as well. You're doing a, doing a good job so far. No? So, um, I just, just on the topic of Gorse Fire, unfortunately, early on this year, at the beginning of the lockdown, whenever the weather was incredibly warm, we did witness a lot of uh, those Gorse Fires in my own district, where, where I'm from as well. Um, but I will say that it's important that, uh, that the department, indeed all the departments, educate and inform people as to the damage that these fires do to people's lives, to the biodiversity. And indeed, whenever the people here be impacted uh, by these fires, try to engage with the compensation agency, it becomes like a, a legal quagmire for them as well. So does the Minister agree it's important that everyone, everybody together does their best to educate and inform people about these fires and the impact that they, ha they have? Um, yes, can I thank the member? Um, we live and we are very privileged to live in one of the most beautiful parts of the world. Uh, and many of us, um, and uh, like the member from South Down, uh, my whole family is from the Mourns area, so I know exactly the beauty um, of uh, these particular uh, areas. So it is really disappointing when people who are there abuse um, their, their privilege uh, of walking and, and having um, uh, time in the hills. And what I would say is that we need to have that kind of multi-agency approach between the NIEA, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, the Forestry Service, the Rescue Services, um, to uh, try to have the strategy right so that people can be safe um, in these beautiful areas, but also have respect for them as well. And I agree with the member that this will require um, information campaigns so that people understand their responsibilities. Thank, <coughs> excuse me, thank you, members. And we now move to topical questions. Before I call the first member, members will know that I'm a, a relaxed and fairly easygoing sort of a person and wouldn't stand too much on formality or uh, anything like that. But if I could impress upon members short, sharp questions, please. And to have a perfect example of that, I call Mr. Daniel McCrossan. You may judge that in a minute. <laughs> uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I too would like to associate uh, myself with the comments and wishing uh, Minister Putz uh, well and a speedy recovery, and also to put firmly on record my sincerest appreciation to him for visiting Mean Bog uh, outside of Castle Derg following the slippage that caused huge difficulties. It was a very, very uh, good meeting, and I was glad to be there. Um, Minister, uh, I know you're uh, filling in today, but is it possible to give an update uh, on the Department's work? Uh, regarding mean the Mean Bog landslide and specifically uh, where we are in terms of clean-up, uh, in terms of the root cause, confirming the root cause, even though most of us know what it is, and what works have been undertaken to prevent it happening in future. Thank you. Well, I did um, read some of the newspaper reports of the visit to Mean Bog um, uh, it is just over the last 12 hours that I've become much more uh, tuned in to the issues involved uh, there. Um, so I'm happy uh, to tell the member that the LOCKS agency staff are continuing their investigation into the recent um, major water pollution incident um, there. Um, the incident uh, appears to be the result of significant slippage of an enormous quantity of peat and soil at the upper end of the catchment uh, around the waterway. Um, the nature and type of the remedial uh, measures uh, will be uh, dependent on the environmental assessments that are currently uh, underway, and those will include water quality data, fisheries evaluations, invertebrate assessments, and riverbed silt uh, evaluation. And it will be some time um, before that is done. But as this is an issue uh, that the Minister has taken and has met his counterpart uh, from the Republic of Ireland on, and that it is being worked on by the LOCKS agency and uh, is being taken taken forward as a matter of priority. Thank you. Mr. McCrossan. I thank the Minister for the answer to the question uh, and absolutely acknowledge that the mean bog uh, slippage was a uh, catastrophe and affected Cleeter, Ahi Iron, Castle Derg and Ardstrawn area surrounding uh, quite, quite significantly. Uh, and the meeting between Minister Putz and Minister McConnell was very, very effective and uh, showed a great uh, sign of strength and, 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 and unity around this particular cross border issue. Uh, Minister, one particular business was impacted very, very badly as a result of the slippage. I'm not sure if you're 
you'll be aware, but maybe you'll update us now or on a further stage, if there's any form of uh, compensation that could help uh, the pressure that's been put on that business and, uh, by way of compensation. Well, while I am aware of the measures that uh, the Locks Agency are undertaking um, around the remedial issues that need to be resolved because of this uh, particular issue, I am today unaware of the particular business, uh, but I will, of course, ask officials from the department uh, to contact you and talk uh, through the issue uh, that uh, is of interest to you. Ms. Rachel Woods. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too wish Minister Poots all the best as he recovers and for the Minister for standing in today, and I will be very short in my questions. I would like to ask the Minister how, to outline how rural perspectives were considered when drafting the Clean Air Strategy. Um, I, I as with all uh, of these particular strategies, there is a very wide-ranging uh, number of perspectives uh, that are taken into account. But if the member has a particular concern that a very particular issue was not addressed, then I would advise her to write to the minister so that it can be properly considered. Ms. Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, I would like, like to ask why a population of 10,000 was chosen as a threshold beyond which air quality assessment would be conducted, even though this would exclude most rural areas from assessment and risk ag agriculture pollution not being fully measured. I'm presuming the modelling um, indicated that this was a, a particular uh, number that was acceptable. Um, in this particular incident, uh, but of course um, I would advise the member to contact the minister, to write to the minister and advise him of her concerns. Mr Doug Beattie. And it's good to see uh, the economy minister supporting her, her ministerial colleague. I look forward to the day when uh, ministers from right across the floor will support each other. Um, minister, following the su successful river works on the, the Blackwater in catchment, um, has the, uh, the Minister any plans to expand those works further along the river ban? I would, of course, be very supportive of this from a um, constituency point of view. Um, I consider the River Ban and our particular part of it to be one of the most beautiful parts of Northern Ireland. Um, and I am, of course, and uh, it is a personal view, uh, since I um, walk the river quite a lot um, during uh, the, the, the week with the dogs, um, I, I, I would consider that this is important. Um, can I say on a general basis, and I, I will uh, report this to the Minister, but can I say on a general basis um, that um, there has been really good work done in some of the remedial tidying up and the dredging of, of, of so much um, unnecessary dumping uh, of rubbish in, in the river and so on. Um, and I think as a general point of view that we would want to see cooperation to make sure that these issues uh, don't happen and that people act responsibly to ensure that the beautiful environment we have is maintained. Mr. Peaty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and Minister, I kept my questions local because um, I knew you were standing in. But just to add to that, uh, as you know, local constituent um, John Medlow uh, has been working hard with volunteers to clean the river ban himself. Um, I believe you might have met him. Does the Minister have any plans to give financial aid to allow volunteers like John and other groups to carry on this really important work? I do agree with you that it is important work. Um, and I think that um, caring for, sustaining, um, and future-proofing uh, the assets we have are hugely, hugely important. Um, and I speak not just as a local, um, but also as the tourism minister, because we need uh, to ensure that we have the best. This, this is what brings people to Northern Ireland. Um, so um, I, 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 I want to commend the groups for their work and, and what they do. Uh, and of course, uh, I will pass on your concerns to the minister around funding for such groups. Mr. Gordon Dom. Deputy Speaker, as we all strive for a cleaner and greener environment, can the minister clarify who has responsibility for the cleaning of litter and detritus from our public footpaths and roadsides? Well, as um, the member said, we all have our part to play in this. Um, and I know that the Minister is committed 
um, to um, education um, and building civic pride around our beautiful environment. Um, and uh, that the department does work closely with councils and other NGOs uh, to support um, education promotional campaigns that achieve uh, behavioural change uh, in uh, reduction of litter. DERA's Environment Fund supports Keeping Northern Ireland Beautiful, which runs a series of successful programmes, including Eco Schools, Live Here, Love Here, Clean Coast, Adopt a Spot, and over three million has been awarded to Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful since 2007, with an additional current funding of over one million to support educational and promotional campaigns. Um, the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act enables councils to issue fines of eight, up to £80 for litter offences uh, or uh, £2,500 fines for cases that have to be dealt with through the court. These are very, very important issues and impact on everybody's everyday life, and I thank the member for raising it. Mr Tom. Mr for answer, can the minister, though, um, under the Litter Order Act of 1994 in Northern Ireland, can she uh, give us an assurance that NAEA will use their influence on local councils to ensure that public footpaths and roadways are clean and safe for all road users? Because there does seem to be a reluctance by some councils to clean public footpaths on roads where there is extensive traffic use. I am sure the Minister will agree with the member that it is extremely important that we use every power available as to us to make sure that we have um, done our best to make sure that uh, roads, uh, footpaths, etc. are clean um, and fit for purpose um, and suitable for the beautiful uh, environment that we have in Northern Ireland. Mr. Trevor Lunn. Deputy Speaker and Minister, could you pass on my good wishes to Edwin Poots, my constituency colleague as well. Um, I want to ask about anaerobic digestion plants. Sorry to spring this on you, but the, uh, Mr. Minister Poots has let it be known more than once, and actually recently, that he doesn't think that Northern Ireland needs an incinerator. So could I ask the Minister on his behalf to outline what she feels that the impact would be on the provision of anaerobic digestion plants? Well, we currently um, <clears throat> have the, the debate around uh, the incinerator. I have no intention of uh, engaging in that today. Um, however, uh, my department is responsible for a new energy strategy um, and looking at different types of energy and how that can be uh, inputted into the grid will be absolutely key to that. We hope to bring out that, consult that strategy for consultation in March of next year um, and uh, the member will, I am sure, contribute uh, his views on anaerobic digestion um, and waste and energy within that. Mr. Lund. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister would know that the, the, the jury is out on anaerobic digestion as a long term solution to our needs, particularly in view of the, the carbon footprint of the whole process, the um, ex extent to which they depend on government subsidy at the moment, and the limited life of the plant involved, which I believe is no more than about 10 years, a huge cost to replace it. So, are we quite sure that the, the Edwin, sorry, Minister Poots should not exclude totally the requirement for an incinerator because an awful lot of academic information out there seems to indicate that we do need one and fairly quickly. I am sure the member will make his views on this issue uh, known uh, to Minister Putz in relation to uh, the issue of waste and, as I have said, in relation to the issue of energy and the contribution to energy. Um, the strategy will be out for consultation in March of this year and I look forward to uh, receiving various views uh, on all of these issues. Thank you. Mr Mervyn Storey. Principal Speaker, and can I, with others, pass on? My best wishes to my colleague, uh, the Minister for Agriculture. And can I also uh, just add to the Minister's 
comments about the River Balance. You'll also know that it does run through my constituency as well. And Drummond Hagels, uh, uh, adjacent to the River Balm, is also a beautiful part of Northern Ireland, and I have no doubt you've enjoyed some happy times there as well. Could the Minister provide an update on the initiative to tackle rural poverty and social isolation? Because this has become an issue, Minister, that you'll be well aware of in your other ministerial responsibility, particularly over the last number of months in relation to the impact of COVID. Yes. Um, can I thank the member for his uh, question around uh, rural uh, poverty? and social isolation and indeed particularly the issue of isolation and loneliness has been exacerbated um, by the COVID restrictions um, and there are some very touching stories of how that has impacted um, folk, particularly older folk living uh, within uh, isolated rural areas. The um, TRIPSI programme continues to provide support to a range of initiatives in collaboration with other government departments, statutory agent agencies and the community and voluntary sector. Um, this has uh, helped on average 60,000 rural dwellers to address poverty, isolation and health and wellbeing issues. An additional uh, 5 million has been confirmed to help rural dwellers, communities and assist businesses to recover from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. This brings the TRIPSI programme budget for 2020-21 to almost £11 million. This uh, increase in financial support has uh, enabled the department to uh, approve a number of schemes to bolster the rural economy to sustain and increase capacity within the rural economy. 30 seconds. Uh, Mr Storey. Mr Principal Speaker, uh, could the Minister maybe update us and clarify if there has been collaboration with the Department for Communities in relation to this initiative? Yes, um, the department works closely with the Department for Communities and with local councils as delivery agents in relation to this initiative. And it is indeed very valuable uh, for rural dwellers in Northern Ireland. Thank you, members. That concludes questions to the Minister for Agriculture. If members take their ease for a few moments, we will then move on to questions to the Minister for Communities. And if you're leaving the chamber, don't forget to clean the surface where you were sitting. Thank you.